We thank you, God, that that is an eternal and uh, almighty truth that you are good. And we stand on that goodness and we trust you, God, because you're trustworthy. And we, we just point in your direction the great goodness. Thank you, God, for all that you are to us. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> How are you all doing? Are you, uh, let, tell me, have you got any bad habits? Put your hand up if you, I'm not going to tell you, ask you to say what it is. Put your hand up if you have ever had a bad habit in your life, ever. Some people have got, not got their hands up. Okay. <laughs> Honesty is a good habit. <laughs> have you ever noticed that um, bad habits are easier to form than good ones? Yeah? And... Uh, the Daily Mail recently produced a list of the 50 worst bad habits. What do you think are on there? What do you reckon? Shout out one. Picking your toenails, picking your, toenails, picking your nose. Disgusting. Top one. Yeah, top one is swearing. Okay, that's what people think they do. That's their worst habit. Let's see what they are. They're not, it's, it's horrible reading. Swearing, nose picking, not listening when others are speaking. Biting your nails, eating too much chocolate, snoring, procrastinating, not brushing your teeth twice a day, naughty, uh, drinking alcohol and burping. Number 49 is biting your toenails. Yuck. So, habit, yeah. Yeah, just get your head around. There's a little picture of that, Steve. <laughs> yeah, habits. What do we, how do we form good habits? Yeah, okay, quickly and moving on. <laughs> you know, listen to this. This is a, a quote from somebody called David Matthias. He's written about how to form good habits, God habits. And, and uh, he says this. It's quite a strong statement. Perhaps you agree or disagree. Your perseverance under God is in your habits. Heaven and hell hangs on habits, he says. Show me someone's habits and you'll give me a glimpse into their very soul. The habits you develop and sustain today will affect whether you persevere till the end or make a shipwreck of the faith. That's strong, isn't it? Do you think it's true? You know, what they say about habits is that they are um, things that you do without thinking. You know, and the power of a habit is that it's, it's a slightly unthinking thing. Not in its formation, but as it becomes a habit, it's something that you continue to do with less thought. So if you listen to Richard a minute ago when he's talking about developing this new relationship with God, he was starting to form a habit of prayer, wasn't he, as he was going on his bike. And then he got knocked off his bike and he lost a bike or it got stolen. But the habit of prayer started becoming ingrained. And so he's using it in his walking to, to work and starting to talk to God. And that's a really great habit, isn't it, to form. And what we understand is that, is that as a habit starts to form, there's less debate. Shall I pray today? Shall I read my Bible today? Do I need to forgive people? It, because the power of a habit is that it, you don't have to give it all that kind of room in your life. It's something that you agree is really good. So we're going to start looking over the next few weeks at some really good God habits. And we're looking, uh, we're looking in the letter of John, 1 John. And this is John as an old man reflecting back on life, looking back and teaching the early church these this is the way. This is how it looks. And, you know, John is just a lovely sounding person <laughs> in the New Testament. He seems to have this sort of great loving heart, a sort of tenderness about him. And we're going to listen to some of the things that he says about the habit. So we're going to start on looking at the habit of confession. Now, that might not be the one that you think, oh, yes, I'd love to start a habit of that. Who loves confessing? Mm. We don't, do we? There's something a little bit counterintuitive about the idea of confessing, which means that if it is a biblical principle, a scriptural thing that we're encouraged to do, it's probably going to encounter a bit of resistance in us, isn't it? Um, but how do we? But if you're parents, you will know that confessing 
it's really important when you're trying to teach your children how to become good people, isn't it? It seems to matter, not just that they say sorry, but that they say sorry for the thing and they kind of own it. We always used to say to our children, no, don't just say sorry. Say the name of the person that you've offended and what you did. And uh, (laughs) they hated that bit. But there's something about actually owning it. Um, I just released this morning a first-time confession never before heard in out loud um, of something that I did when I was five years old when I first went to school. It was my first week of school and I, I went to Henley's Infant School for six weeks and then we moved and, uh, and I left there. But I did something there that sort of, you know, left a little deposit in my soul, I think. Um, I broke a pencil in my first week and I went to the teacher and I confessed I'd broken a pencil. And do you know what she said? She said, go to the head teacher and tell the head teacher what you've done. She did. And I did. I went off my little five-year-old self, went down the corridor, and I stood outside the room of the head teacher. And um, I looked at that door, and I couldn't go in. And I, after a few minutes, I crept back down the corridor and went back into my classroom, and I said to the teacher... She said to stick it back together. (laughs) I lied. And uh, yeah, I confessed. But there's something about confession (laughs) that is very, very unpleasant. And it needs a little bit of pushing up against. So we're going to listen to what John says about confession today. And we're going to... We're going to uh, go look at a verse particularly, which many of us will know off by heart, and I would love us all to know off by heart by the end of this sermon. So I'm going to, we're going to say it now, we're going to read it in context, and we'll say it again a couple more times. So the, the verse, and you need to know the reference because it's really good to be able to look it up, is 1 John 1, 9. So let's say that together. 1 John 1, 9. And the verse is, if we confess our sins... If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, yes, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us, and will forgive us, and purify us from all unrighteousness, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Big verse. Okay, so we're going to look at this in its context, um, and hopefully pick up some good tips. So let's read it now. So a few verses in, it begins, it says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us let's read this blue bit together if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness okay so this is john looking back and he's trying to coach the church in ways, in some God habits. And, you know, as he begins this letter, it's the beginning of this, at the very beginning, there's a few verses ahead, and he talks about God, the Word, coming into the world, and he says, we met him, and we heard him, we encountered him. And it's obviously fresh in his mind as he's describing it. It's a beautiful little poet, poetic beginning to the passage. Of, we met him, we encountered him, this which we heard. And then he goes on to say this, that God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. This is John reflecting on his experience of meeting Jesus and knowing him and then following him for years and years towards the end of his life he is now. He's light. There's no darkness in him. And then he, what would you say next? You know, you're coaching this young church how to walk with him. And the the next thing that happens in John's mind is he he kind of comes up against, I think, the reality of human, what we call sinfulness. You know, the fact that we are not light. There is sometimes darkness in us. 
And probably we've got to put our hand up and say that the reason why we don't want to put our hand up and confess something is because we're aware that we don't want some stuff in us to come into the light. And John, it's obvious, it's his train of thought. Yeah, God is light. There's no darkness in him, but I'm not always light. And we are not always full of light. And yet we're trying to have this fellowship with him. And he's saying, if we're claiming to have fellowship with him, but uh, we're claiming not to be sinful, then, 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 you know, we've got it wrong. This is not how it is. And he... He, he's really saying to the, the people that, that he's speaking to, he's saying, it's right that you want to be in the light. God is light, and we are in fellowship with this light being, this pure light being. And there's something in us that stops us fully entering into that fellowship. And he even goes on to say the fellowship with, we have with each other is affected by this. Now, we know that's true, don't we? As soon as we start resisting God's command to forgive, for example, we know that our relationships start to dissipate and distance comes between us and between us and God. And John is saying, that fellowship is right. We want the light. Um, but so what his, his mind next goes to the solution to that, and it's interesting, it's right at the beginning of this whole book on how to love and live and walk like Jesus. He says this, he says, if we confess our sins, though, he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I think before we go on to look specifically at that verse, I just want us to reflect, you know, how does it look internally? You know, that author at the beginning, he said, you know, you look at a man's habits, a person's habits, it's a glimpse into our souls. What, what does it look like, the internal landscape of our souls? What are, what are our habits patterns? Are we stuck in bad habits? Are we ingrained in life patterns and thought patterns that are quite dark? And what do we do about them? Have we got a practice of bringing our internal self out into the light? And it's really clear from all the way through the Bible, actually, not just the New Testament, that bringing your stuff out into the light is one of God's invitations to us to deal with it. And you can't really deal with it when it's stuck in the darkness. In the Old Testament, the, the Jewish practice was of, of dealing with their sins was very public. It was out in the temple and in the synagogues. And, you know, it's kind of where the sacrificial system began. And, you know, a person would come and there would be a bull brought to the tent of the meeting. And, you know, they would put their hands on the head, both hands, like that and push down and they'd confess their sins and it was as if they were saying the weight of my sin is in this what will become a death it was very much a thing that you know public confession was part of the practice it's God's invitation to say don't live in the darkness bring your stuff out into the light and you know King David in Psalm 32 he talks about feeling weighed down by stuff that needs confessing. He says this, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. And he says, your hand was heavy on me day and night. And you know who is familiar with that feeling of having done something where we feel the sense that we've gone away from God and we've done something that we're ashamed of. It feels like a darkness and it's heavy in us. And then he says, but I acknowledge my sin to you. I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave my sins. Apparently, the average person has, ha got, has 38 serious secrets in their life. Another little scientific study. And about five of them will never be confessed to anyone. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it? But this, this particular study looked at the effect of having secrets that people didn't want to be known and they said it's actually the, the 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 main effect is the way it preoccupies the mind and draws the energy of the mind into thinking about stuff they don't want to be found out about and you know that it's true to say that it weighs us down so you know it's good to you know I put it out to you what is there in there that you're aware pulls you away from God and pulls you away from the light and takes you into a place of perhaps shame. Well, that's one effect that, what, that sinful, sin, sin has on us. It pulls in, into a place of shame. Internally, we feel heavy. 
Um, what hardens your heart? You know, there's often in the Bible that it speaks of don't harden your heart when you come to God. What is it that actually makes your heart hard? It's usually another person, to be honest. It's rarely some general thing. A person hurts you, upsets you, or you hurt them, and a hardness creeps in. And John is saying, but you're the people of the light. You're invited into this light fellowship. And that stuff, that darkness, needs dealing with. So he says this. He says, confess your sins. And that brilliant verse is just full of potency. For one thing, the word confess doesn't mean just admit it, fess up, just say how it is. It'll all be dealt with. It's not about that. That word, actually, in, it, in the original form that John uses, it means this. It means say the same say the same and it's implying say the same as God the divine about your sin and it's inviting us to look at how we are from God's perspective and saying yeah I want to agree with you God on what you think about that thing even though in my heart in my rebelliousness and my mind and my self-justification and my complexity I might feel like I can see how I think about it but there's this invitation, come into this place of light and see what God says about our sin and about who we really are. So he says, confess your sins. And then he said these four words, and they're full of power. They are faithfulness, justice, forgiveness, and purity. He says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful. You know, this is what God is like. He is not like you and me. He is not fickle or... Um, broken in his response to us. He's pure and good and holy. He is faithful, James says, without a shadow of turning in him. So when we come to him, we meet his faithfulness, even in the face of our fickleness. But we also meet his justice. You know, we know, don't we, that some of the things that we do and say and think and hold to internally, they need justice we can see it in the big picture in the world. You know, Dave prayed about Myanmar, that situation there. It needs justice. It's not good enough to just even say this is how it is. And confession is not that. It is not just saying, yeah, it's like this. It needs justice. And we need justice. And there's this, in this verse, it talks about the faithfulness of God, but also his justice. We come to God in confession, we say the same as he does about our sinfulness and our mistakes and failure and shame. And he meets it with justice. And he says, this is going to cause a death. And it's the death of Jesus. Jesus is provided for us in the same way as the bull at the tent of the meeting to take and bear the weight of sin so that we can be Forgiven, the third word. He will forgive. It's such a simple statement. It's not he will forgive if. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He will forgive. And then most hopefully of all, he says he will purify us. And that is an amazing thought, isn't it? For some of the stuff that we might carry that we actually feel secretly. If anyone was to know, we feel very impure and very broken and yet God says to us when I forgive I don't just let you off I begin the process of purifying you I'm changing you as you invite the spirit into you and, and confess your sins I will change you so that you do say the same about your stuff as I do so that you become gradually more and more the children of the light, behaving, thinking, feeling in line with him in whom there is no darkness. It's an amazing reality. And so when we come to communion in a few moments, there'll be an invitation for all of us to come to God and confess and meet the faithfulness, the justice of God and re receive his forgiveness and let him begin to purify and change us from within. The practice of, of confession, it, it all depends a little bit that we go that step of confession. You know, God can confess on our behalf. He can say stuff about us. But actually, there's something about us 
choosing to surrender the hardness of heart, the barriers, the self-justification, all the reasons why we do things and say, yeah, it's true. I am like this. I do think like that. I do behave like that. I can't forgive that person. I'm broken. I can't do it. And in all humility, God, I come to you and say, I'm stuck. I need your help. I just confess it. In wholeness uh, that we run here twice a year, we talk a lot about the power of confession because we've seen it over and over again in prayer, in wholeness courses, in one-to-one prayer ministry, this incredible power of confession, of, of surrendering, of just coming with a, with a humble heart and saying, I'm broken here, I need help. The power of that outward confession to God and also to other people. It's a powerful thing. It's as if it breaks the power of shame, the yoke of shame, the darkness of shame. You know, we, we see in Scripture, don't we, that the very beginning of sin where God and human beings separated in the very first place, things that set in, in those chapters in Genesis, they speak of shame. Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes, unable to face God, afraid of him when, when before they weren't afraid. That's what our sin does to us and God's invitation is confess your sin get it out into the open, come to me in humility and say, I need your help. And actually, that, that is the third aspect of, of confession. I just want to emphasize a little bit. There's something very powerful about doing it in community and confessing our sins to one another. You know, I think that confession should be a regular daily practice for all of us. It should be a habit that we put ourselves under the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit, the loving eye of God, and say, today it's been like this, and I have been broken in these ways, and I'm, you know, I've willfully hurt people or you, God, and that should be a habitual daily practice. It's a good habit. But there's, there's this invitation in, in Scripture, too, to confess our sins to one another, that bit we like least of all, don't we? In fact, it's not that hard once you know God and you're familiar with him to confess to God, is it? In all honesty. But there's some other thing that we've got to climb down off, the pedestal of I want people to see me like this and I'm afraid that you will judge me and all of that stuff that actually gets at our insecurity and our identity. God says, yeah, I want you to go there too. This is what my community is supposed to look like. That fellowship that John was talking about in the light is supposed to look like this. My people, humbly, together, in community, confessing to one another. And Jesus, when he breathed his spirit on the disciples, when he, when the, with the birth of the church and the coming of the Holy Spirit, he said this incredible thing to them. He said, receive my spirit if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. What an amazing thing to bring together. The filling of the Holy Spirit and the commissioning of each believer, each disciple, to be able to go out and take that office of hearing confession out anywhere and be able to actually say your sins are forgiven. And whoever you are here today, if you have come into that relationship with Jesus, even if you're a baby Christian, Jesus breathes his spirit into you and says, if you forgive sins, that's like, that's like a big deal, isn't it? And actually it behoves on us to carry that well, to be confidential, for example, to be gracious and non-judging when we hear people confess. But I think that that is the vision of Jesus for his church, is that Sometimes it happens up at the front in prayer ministry, but other times it's in our friendships, in our home groups, in our conversations that we are able to say to each other, I got something to say. I've got something I want to confess. And it's not just sharing a struggle. It's actually, or it's not on offloading. It is actually this almost right of confession. I want to say this to you. I want you to hear it from me. And I want you to pray for me. 
and for, for me to receive the forgiveness of God. That is the picture of a healthy church at work like that. And it's important for us to sort of take seriously Jesus' commission. I just finish by sort of putting it out there as a challenge. You know, is that something that you feel you could go for? A God habit that you would like to build into your life? And, you know, in all honesty, some of us who've been on this journey a long time, you drop off a bit with the habits. <laughs> And you realize that that habit might need a bit of refreshing because, you know, we're all still on this journey. And, and we, we all need to come in humility to God. And then, you know, we can celebrate the mercy of God together. Because it's hard to celebrate the mercy of God together if we're keeping private about everything. But in this communion in a moment, we'll be getting up out of our seats and coming and taking communion saying, I testify to the power of the forgiveness of God. I confess that I'm broken and I need God's love and forgiveness. I need to be purified in my mind and my heart and my soul. And I'm coming and I'm taking bread and wine in community, in the fellowship of the light, with the people of the light, who are like God who is light, in whom there is no darkness. That is communion. And so that's your invitation as you come and get it. You might want to take it to somebody in the church and say, let's be in the light together. Let's confess to each other. It's an amazing opportunity. And it is, you know, this, it's just an invitation from God. But it, it is a serious and sobering invitation. Let's confess our sins to God, to one another, and receive his freedom and forgiveness and his purity. I'll get you just to read it in just a moment, Claire. Well, I, re I remember um, doing a half night of prayer here uh, um, two or three years ago, and um, I just got everybody to say out loud things they're really ashamed of. And there's, it's, it's hard to confess things we're ashamed of, because the things we know are wrong, we're not ashamed of particularly. But um, I can remember someone doing that and confessing something deeply shameful and historic and actually getting really filled with the Holy Spirit on the back of that, because we exchange shame, we find freedom. And uh, this is an opportunity for exchange. So why don't you just, just um, as you think about your own stuff, let's take a moment. God, is there anything that um, I'm just too bad about? I don't want to share it because I feel so broken. And are there things, God, that I'm just not really aware of? They're blind spots, but I need to get them out. I need to know what they are and be able to own them as mine and say sorry. Amen. Yeah, this is just a prayer, actually, I thought we could read together. Um, and it's a prayer of confession. So let's just take a moment. Um, and let's read it out loud together, the bits in yellow. Lord Jesus, I thank you that because of your death on the cross for me, I can come before your throne of grace in confidence and receive mercy and find grace. I come today longing to be completely at peace with you and to find true freedom. I want to be clear of any obstacle to the free flow of your life-giving spirit within me. And I am willing to be shown the truth about myself, however much it hurts. As I begin this time of confession, I ask that you would fill me again with your Holy Spirit and help me to look at myself and my past in order that my future might be free and whole. Thank you, God, for your grace, which fully covers me as I do this today. Amen.